Hello, today on my channel you will hear an amazing story about life. I hope you enjoy this story. This one struck me to the core. Honestly, I still can't forget it. Enjoy watching. John couldn't remember if there had ever been a time when he'd been loved in his own family. Maybe when his mother hadn't divorced his father yet. But when he turned three, his father had already left for the ends of the earth with his new love, and his mother had a new husband. Humiliated by her husband's infidelity, she hurried to prove to herself and to the whole world, it is worth it to dissolve the marriage, as she will not be alone for a single day. The mother was not a very good-looking woman, but they say of such women, she has something in her. Tall, thin like a model, very beautiful haircut, she always got her hair cut by the best hairdresser in town. Big dark eyes, a little bit of her mother reminded him of a young Jacqueline Kennedy. John thought about it when he became an adult and accidentally saw a photo of the widow of the American president. Photos of his father at home did not remain, exactly mother wanted to break with the past absolutely all ties, and the stepfather was a man completely invisible, as my grandmother would say, Soapy. When he married my mother, he was about 50 years old and had no children of his own. It would seem, be happy that he got a son. It remains to be seen whether a common child will be born, but stepfather John immediately hated. At the same time, he was smart enough not to tell his mother about it. If the stepfather openly stated his feelings and demanded that the child anywhere to give grandparents or in a boarding school, the mother would have nothing left but to part with him. But the stepfather said that the stepson has a difficult character, this is a three-year-old, and if he is not put on the right path, the family will be bad. After a few months, John feared his stepfather like fire. They had a dog, an old mutt who liked to sleep in the closet. She would sneak in there, snuggle up in the dark, and fall asleep in a pile of stuff. John began to follow suit. His stepfather came home from work before his mother. He wouldn't let her steps in go to kindergarten. The boy would be totally spoiled there. So John hung around the empty house all day. He didn't know how to tell time yet, but he knew that when both hands of the clock slid down, it was time to hurry to his hiding place. He would lurk there, having learned to bolt the closet from the inside and wait until his mother returned from work. His stepfather, on the other hand, never looked for him. When he arrived, he threw off his heavy shoes with pleasure. He stomped into the kitchen, pulling out what his mother had prepared that morning. John knew the food was primarily for him, but he tried to take as little as possible. The most important thing for him was to keep his stepfather fed and satisfied. The man always brought a drink from work. Not vodka, not my God. My stepfather insistently emphasized that strong alcohol he does not take in his mouth never goes down to white, but beer was his specialty. And by the time his mother came back, he had time to get pretty drunk. Can's stepfather threw in the garbage chute, and the mother had to believe that no one drank here, and the man is sober as a glass. It was the kind of game, John realized that they played every night. At first, when the boy was still in hiding, he would witness these drinking parties, and his stepfather would beat him, not sparingly, not in proportion to his strength beat him to keep him quiet and not to talk. It could well have been a disaster, once the stepfather threw the kid, so that he hit his temple on the corner of the nightstand, but John was lucky. He was never seriously injured, and the stepfather threatened, if the boy tells about the beatings of his mother, the next day you will kill him. And John kept quiet. He even persuaded his mother to let him bathe by himself, so she wouldn't accidentally see his bruises and bruises on his body. He realized now that this was just another dirty family game. His mother knew what was going on, couldn't help but notice John's stricken look, but pretended that all was well in the family. There was another complication in all this. The boy was born handsome. That is, not just a cute kid, but one who could be in a movie or on the cover of a magazine. Black hair like his mother's or his father's. And very light, almost white eyes with a lid. Clearly defined perfect facial features and a fine build. Those who saw the boy for the first time predicted a career as an artist or modeling star. Those who knew John better stopped noticing him. The boy became more and more afraid of people, having no friends, because he was almost never let out on the street, he knew no one but his own family. So he didn't trust people, shutting up, not answering questions, and trying to slip out of the room. John knew that his mother, despite everything, still loved him. When he had once fallen seriously ill, she had seen his genuine concern. When she was in the hospital with him, she was no different from other mothers, and she carried him in her arms when he, small, suffering, could not sleep. 
and she read books to him and told him about her childhood, so that he, who before did not even smile, laughed now as a normal child. But when there was a stepfather, the mother changed, became restrained and cold. Maybe the stepfather beat her too. John had never seen this, but what the saint should have done to her is she did not dare to stroke her son on the head. The only person besides his mother that John had a shadow of trust in was the old neighbor. They ran into each other by chance, usually on the landing, and Aunt Lucy always spoke to the boy affectionately. She saw how withdrawn and fidgety he was, but it did not repel her in the least, she had seen too much in her life. Often she would slip John something tasty, a homemade pie, his mother never baked them, a big brown apple or a chocolate bar. John knew that the neighbor understood everything that was going on in their family, because he had once said, Nothing, you will go to school, there it will be easier for you. And since then, the boy dreamed of the time when he could get out of the house. John already perceived his apartment as a fortress in which he was imprisoned. Kindergarten, okay, it's voluntary. But his mother couldn't keep him out of school, even if his stepfather was against it, and it'll be just like it was at the hospital. Kids and adults who don't fight. If he knew how wrong he was, but then, when his mother started picking him up, like the other first graders, he felt like he was in seventh heaven. His mother went with him to the store and the market, bought and bought different things. He had never had so many things. A suit and a sports suit, shirts, t-shirts, a backpack, notebooks. You could list the riches that now belonged to John. Also, his mother, without asking his stepfather about it, had given John a room. Before, he had slept on the couch in the living room. But now his mother said, you're not going to live here. He likes to watch TV and you have to study. John didn't believe it, but his mother told him to take the smallest room, which used to be his father's study. His desk and bookshelves still stood there. Now they housed his son's textbooks. John was scared. He knew his stepfather liked to nap here on the couch when he had a drink. Let the smell of booze stay in the room and he wouldn't bring it into the bedroom. John suspected he'd get it. But first his stepfather voiced his displeasure to his mother. In his opinion, the boy should be in front of the eyes all the time and nothing to create in royal conditions. Now at school, will appear at his friend's buddies, who knows who he will take to his house and what they will do behind closed doors. Then his stepfather tried to rough John up a few more times. He came with a bottle, told his steps in, get out, and habitually settled down to rest on his favorite couch. But his mother proved once again that she saw and understood everything. John did not know what she said to her husband, but a lock was put on the door of the room, and John was given the key for his own use. He walked to school like a groom to a wedding. He held his mother's hand and held the bouquet to his chest, but his mother didn't stand in the crowd of other parents while the ceremony was going on. She was in a hurry to get to work, so she found her son's class, pushed him over to the other kid, said, get settled in here, and left. John watched the whole thing unfold with his mouth hanging open. At that time he had not yet read the book about Mowgli, but everything around him amazed him. Dressed up children, a sea of flowers, music, balloons, everyone was saying such kind, affectionate words to them, the first graders. Then they were taken to the classroom and Naomi, the young teacher, seated them all in their desks. The parents continued to crowd in the doorway, and as soon as the teacher let them go home, they sorted them out. Naomi had to walk John home. Tell your mother that I won't do it every day. Hell knows what, his mother said, in the first grade to start jamming kids with twos. It can forever discourage learning. I'll talk to that teacher. And the fifth D, can you tell me more about that? You're a good reader. We had poetry. John took another step back, and then the lights went out all night last night. I had to wait for it to come back on, so I fell asleep. I did math and English, but not poetry. Mother went to school. She had a very emotional conversation with the teacher. Naomi dragged her mother to the principal's office, and there she tearfully began to say that she would quit immediately if she was prevented from educating her students in her own way. And she was young, but she was already famous. She had won some competitions, she had her own programs, or maybe there was no one to take her place. Either way, the director valued her. Naomi will not wish bad things to your child, the principal said to the mother and with a sigh added, and if you do not like it here, move the child to another school. But that was a hassle, and the main thing was that the other school was far away, and John would really have to be taken there and picked up, so the mother let it all go. But the worst thing about the school wasn't Nami, it was the kids. 
They mostly came from the same kindergarten, or at least played together in the yard. And John was an outsider. At first, they just ignored him, shunned him. Then they realized he couldn't fight back, so they started bullying him openly. Now it was even a matter of honor for his classmates to pick on him. Throwing textbooks from the desk, pulling his jacket so that the buttons came off, taking away food in the dining hall, locking him in the toilet stall, the guys had the pleasure of inventing more and more bullying. John, on the other hand, raised by his stepfather, never complained. Maybe if he had been beaten here too, his mother would have eventually taken him out of the school. But he wasn't beaten, just bullied. Once he got mobbed in the bathroom and had the zipper of his pants ripped to shreds. And when he was waddling down the school corridor, holding his pants, someone snuck up behind him and yanked them so that they slid down to his knees. Everyone was laughing, especially the girls, laughing loudly, wanting fingers. Maybe if Naomi had been the only one to know about it, it would have been hushed up. But the principal was walking down the hall. Jonah's assailants scurried away like mice, but the principal remembered them. The same day he called them into his office with their parents and had a debriefing. He brought some of them to tears. But who would respect a boy who had his pants pulled down in front of the whole school? And John became an even bigger pariah. He was now simply avoided, but if there were no adults around, they told him something nasty, what a weakling, a nerd, and in general, he was shunned by everyone. And at home now my stepfather demanded a diary and pulled out his belt. He bought himself a new one, with a big heavy metal buckle that left bruises that didn't go away for a long time. But when the boys changed at school for gym class, John was chased out of the gym locker room, and he changed in the bathroom, where no one could see his bruises. The worst was in the last grade of elementary school. The classmates got stronger, the bullying got more sophisticated. Then one day, Aunt Lucy saw the unprecedented sight of John curled up in the stairwell, sobbing. He broke down. He had to get up, to go into the apartment where his stepfather was waiting for him. But he couldn't do it, it seemed to him. The whole world was hitting him, and there wasn't even a tiny corner left where he would feel safe. Hell knows what, his mother said, in the first grade to start jamming kids with twos. It can forever discourage learning. I'll talk to that teacher. And the fifth D, can you tell me more about that? You're a good reader. We had poetry. John took another step back, and then the lights went out all night last night. I had to wait for it to come back on, so I fell asleep. I did math and English, but not poetry. Mother went to school. She had a very emotional conversation with the teacher. Naomi dragged her mother to the principal's office, and there she tearfully began to say that she would quit immediately if she was prevented from educating her students in her own way. And she was young, but she was already famous. She had won some competitions, she had her own programs, or maybe there was no one to take her place. Either way, the director valued her. Naomi will not wish bad things to your child, the principal said to the mother, and with a sigh added, and if you do not like it here, move the child to another school. But that was a hassle, and the main thing was that the other school was far away, and John would really have to be taken there and picked up. So the mother let it all go. But the worst thing about the school wasn't Naomi, it was the kids. They mostly came from the same kindergarten, or at least played together in the yard, and John was an outsider. At first, they just ignored him, shunned him. Then they realized he couldn't fight back, so they started bullying him openly. Now it was even a matter of honor for his classmates to pick on him. Throwing textbooks from the desk, pulling his jacket so that the buttons came off, taking away food in the dining hall, locking him in the toilet stall, the guys had the pleasure of inventing more and more bullying. John, on the other hand, raised by his stepfather, never complained. Maybe if he had been beaten here too, his mother would have eventually taken him out of this school. But he wasn't beaten, just bullied. Once he got mobbed in the bathroom and had the zipper of his pants ripped to shreds. And when he was waddling down the school corridor, holding his pants, someone snuck up behind him and yanked them so that they slid down to his knees. Everyone was laughing, especially the girls, laughing loudly, wanting fingers. Maybe if Naomi had been the only one to know about it, it would have been hushed up. But the principal was walking down the hall. Jonah's assailants curried away like mice, but the principal remembered them. The same day he called them into his office with their parents and had a debriefing. He brought some of them to tears. But who would respect a boy who had his pants pulled down in front of the whole school? And John became an even bigger pariah. He was now simply avoided. But if there were no adults around, they told him something nasty, 
what a weakling, a nerd, and in general, he was shunned by everyone. And at home now my stepfather demanded a diary and pulled out his belt. He bought himself a new one, with a big heavy metal buckle that left bruises that didn't go away for a long time. But when the boys changed at school for gym class, John was chased out of the gym locker room, and he changed in the bathroom, where no one could see his bruises. The worst was in the last grade of elementary school. The classmates got stronger, the bullying got more sophisticated. Then one day, Aunt Lucy saw the unprecedented sight of John curled up in the stairwell sobbing. He broke down. He had to get up, to go into the apartment where his stepfather was waiting for him, but he couldn't do it. It seemed to him. The whole world was hitting him, and there wasn't even a tiny corner left where he would feel safe. Techniques. Parents of the children who poisoned John were also scared and tried their best to keep their children in line. God forbid you will have to bring you to justice if the boy does something to himself, the lawyer told them. In short, the father took John away with him, shrunken and frightened of the coming changes in his life. Aunt Lucy hugged the boy and promised him that everything in his life would be fine. Jacob did not take his son in. He was always traveling, living the life of a busy businessman. He was not going to marry again, and his household was run by servants. The father followed the advice of an old teacher and placed his son in a very good and expensive closed school. There he immediately made it clear that the boy requires classes with a psychologist, a long rehabilitation, but he really hopes that eventually the guy will fit into the team. Gradually amazing changes began to happen to John. It came to him that here, in this school, no one will not say a rude word to him, he is a rich hare, his father is the coolest. And the one who would see the young man in a few years would never believe that before he was a quiet, battered boy who was afraid to say a word. John became tough, sharp-tongued, no longer afraid of anything and everything. Now no one was an authority for him, on the contrary, now he was feared by children and teachers. It would seem that John should have understood better than anyone how hard it is to live when you are poisoned and never allow this to happen to others. But on the contrary, he liked to humiliate his peers and younger kids, he enjoyed ridiculing teachers in public. They tried talking to him, to no avail. At school, say, had to be found. Secondly, Emma was an excellent swimmer. In the third place, as the expertise found out, the girl had drowned recently, so the rest of the time she was somewhere. But where? It was impossible to get lost in the school district. At any point in the forest, you could hear the noise of cars and figure out where to go to get to the highway. But most importantly, Emma's wrists were bound, which meant someone had been holding her by force all this time. The mystery was never solved. Neither the girl nor her parents had any enemies. No one blackmailed them or extorted money. In short, no motive, no perpetrator. When the guys were questioned, they could say that the only person with whom Emma did not develop a relationship was John. But how many young people tease each other? Besides, the kid never dropped out of school, always on the radar. And yet I feel uncomfortable for some reason when I look at him, admitted the school principal to colleagues, yes, he is very handsome, from him can long not take your eyes off as a work of art, and at the same time. Here we have all repeatedly talked about the fact that John could play in the movie, would be the idol of millions of girls. But who could he play? I was thinking about it for the first time recently. And you know what came to mind? Vampires, werewolves, sons of the devil, that sort of thing. Bingo, agreed the chemistry teacher. I'm always a little sad when we graduate. It's a shame to let go of kids who've worked so hard. But here I just can't wait for this young man to leave the walls of our institution. There's something about him that gives me the creeps. What do you think, Nellie? You know him best, don't you? Nellie was the school counselor. She was the one who worked the hardest with little Hero when he was brought to school. Well, what can I tell you girls? Her voice was sad. You remember what he was like. When a child like that comes to school, you always want to cheer him up, give him more warmth than others. Pity, kindness and love can sometimes work wonders, but not in this case. I'd hoped that John would gradually catch up with his peers, become an open-minded boy who believes that not all people are evil and that many people treat him well. But he did. Yes, he caught up with his peers, and in some respects he far exceeded them. When I conducted certain tests with him, sometimes I could not believe my eyes. They showed hidden cruelty, aggression, and to a very high degree. It seemed that the tests were wrong the first time. It's not about John. Anyone could hurt him, and he, he'd be afraid to raise his hand to a fly. But what he was hiding in his soul was accumulating, 
accumulating all these years, and it seems that now it has finally formed. I confess, I'm afraid of that boy myself. He's always very nice to you, the chemist said, but it's us poor people who get it from him. And as for you, he probably remembers how much you fiddled with him. Not that I'm afraid, the psychologist corrected herself, but if I didn't know him, I wouldn't want to meet him somewhere in the woods or some other deserted place. Even if he just walked toward me and looked me in the eye. You were kidding about the vampires and werewolves, but there's a joke in every joke, as the saying goes. I don't care for jokes, the principal said grimly, after our Emma's death. Such a golden girl, she was going to the university. The teachers were silent, but each was thinking of one thing. It had been proved that John had not left the school all those days. Why was it his hard grin that came to mind when they remembered Emma's death? Wanted to hide quietly in the house, lock themselves behind all the locks, and it was unknown whether it would help. When two or three of them appeared in the village store, it was empty, and the clerk's hands began to tremble. The men always bought the same things, a lot of bread, meat, alcohol, and cigarettes, sugar, coffee. I don't know if it's a bulk buy or a robbery, said Cindy, the clerk. I'd give them anything to get them out of my store. The only people who saw the castle were those who went far into the woods. Mushroom pickers, fishermen going to a distant lake or hunters. But in time they began to avoid this place, because as soon as they approached it, as if from under the ground grew a black-bearded guardian. What do you want here? Go away. Did you buy this forest or what? Rumbled another hapless mushroom picker, but hurried away. Everyone realized that it was better not to cross these people. The locals were expecting trouble. They sensed it as they knew, even before any forecasters, whether this year's winter would be frosty and summer would be dry. True, they thought that the newcomers would set fire to something or fight with someone or, God forbid, something worse would happen. And no one paid attention when in the nearest town to them, the one where people always went for shopping, for entertainment, for doctor's appointments if necessary, people started disappearing there more often than usual. Before, children disappeared, and luckily, in most cases, were found afterwards. They simply got lost, or forgot to say they were going to a friend's house, and their parents immediately sounded the alarm. Another category of lost people were old people with memory problems. They would leave home and forget where they were going and how to get back. But now young people are going missing. Teenagers, girls, only once the wave reached the village. The police came, brought a card, asked questions. The girl Cecilia left the house towards evening. She told her mother that she was going out for a walk and to buy some bread. When she didn't come back in two hours, her mother started looking for her. The next day volunteers were looking for Lilia. They're still looking for her. A pretty girl, red-haired, with small features. She taught piano at the college. No one in the village could remember having seen such a girl, and they didn't bother the people with inquiries. And, of course, no one connected Cecilia's disappearance with the castle in the woods, which, if not for the periodic visits of its guards to the store, would have been forgotten by now. John didn't know if he'd done the right thing by secluding himself from the world. On the one hand, he liked the house to the point of madness. It had everything his master wanted. The monolithic stone walls that gave him a sense of security and all the furnishings inside, the black-colored designer furniture, the strange surrealist paintings, the subdued lighting, and the silence all around. Those who surrounded John, whether servants or guards, knew that the master could not tolerate chatter, that music, especially loud and rhythmic music, infuriated him. So the guards spoke as little as possible in his presence, nodding their heads to indicate that they understood the order. The silence was healing for John. There were times when he spent days half lying by the window in a rocking chair, and there were no sounds except the bird sound outside the window. On the other hand, John himself realized that this was not normal, that even the life he had led before, with night racing through deserted streets, with drinking, with buddies he didn't remember the next morning, was more natural than his present reclusiveness, but he was sick, and he realized it himself. He'd have felt his illness when his father was alive, and John had wanted to go into the den he needed to. But his father wouldn't let him do that, he would make John work, he would have to support himself, he would have to look after him, and that was unbearable. When John was left alone, it was as if his mind had given him the go-ahead, and he immediately set about realizing his plan to go somewhere where no one could get him. John knew that wherever he was, from time to time he would be overcome with rage and longing, so intense that it took his breath away. 
He remembered the humiliation of his childhood, as if he were reliving the strokes of his belt, the bullying of his classmates, the years not just cut out of his life, but spent in hell. And then he wanted to howl, because he could not take revenge at that time, but had to humble himself, to accept all offenses without complaint. And John knew that only one thing could dampen that feeling of sizzling rage, other people's pain. It was like a powerful drug, even if it only worked for a short time. Maybe he should have gotten real treatment, but he knew, after all he'd done, no one would ban him from a mental institution. Prison awaited him, which he couldn't stand, because he would be humiliated there too. So it was necessary to reconcile all this somehow, to sacrifice again and again to the god of rage that lived in his soul, and then to hide all the consequences, and his helpers were men who knew no fear, no compassion, and no shame. And John paid generously for their services. He himself appeared in public very rarely, maybe a few times a year, on those days when he felt like his old self, a healthy, calm young man. And then he would go by car to the city, he could sit in some restaurant, or make a reservation in advance, or fall in with some of his old friends, or even go into the old madness with nightclubs. However, he was always accompanied by one of the black-bearded guards. A bodyguard, he explained briefly, if any of his friends wondered who it was. Brr, one of his friends responded, I wouldn't want to entrust my life to a man like that. He looks like he could stab you in the middle of the road. Look in his eyes, he's not a man, he's a wolf. Wolf loyalty is legendary. John grinned and changed the subject. Sometimes though, he would slow down and point to a girl who was passing by. That one, he'd say. The girl would be followed, and the hour would come when John would get his hands on her. And then the day came when black-bearded Sam showed up in the room where John was smoking alone, enjoying the scarlet sunset burning outside the window. Gotta be careful, master, he said. Sam had spoken countless times in front of John so he didn't ignore the words, raising his eyebrows. What's the matter? Pretend you're like everyone else. Stop. At least for a little while. They've started looking too close around us. Who? Names John didn't remember, the black one. But they won't find her. They won't, yeah, Sam nodded, they found her car. On the road to your house. What was that fool doing there? And why didn't anyone think to move the car? She just got lost, yeah. And Stan got excited, yeah. A beautiful girl came into her own. He knew you'd be glad. He just forgot about her car. Unforgivable oversight. Unforgivable, yeah, you won't go hunting again. But I beg you, master, lay low for a while. We'll see, John said grudgingly. And that's when, just then, Catherine came into his life. Catherine never thought that she would become a mother of many children. No, no, she imagined her life very beautiful, like a princess. Such dreams appeared at her just since her mother gave her an airy princess dress. Catherine was brought up by one mother. The woman was kind, with a good character, but ugly as a mortal sin. Crooked teeth protruded forward like Baba Yaga, and many children, seeing her for the first time, began to cry. Catherine's mother was a social worker. She took care of old people, carried them groceries from the store, took coupons to doctors and cleaned apartments. The salary was penniless, and Aunt Maria was tired to the point that by evening, she could not stand on her feet. But she always had time to carve out a minute and run home, to see how her own daughter was doing, to feed her hot food, and make sure she sat down to study. Free time, even just a few minutes, was the only thing Aunt Maria ever wanted. As for money, she was never once tempted to take a penny from her elders. As a result, they trusted her more than they trusted themselves and more than one grandmother told her where she had the funeral money in her closet, so that in case of emergency Aunt Maria could dispose of it as intended. And although the small family lived hard and very modestly, yet by New Year's Eve on a lush airy dress for Catherine mother saved up, and the girl shown in the garden is not worse than other girls. And then Catherine, very fond of fairy tales, invented a story to herself that she is actually a princess, which in infancy lost her parents. But when the time comes, and she will have everything, and the palace, and untold wealth, and of course the prince. Everything that Catherine dreamed of, falling asleep, was so beautiful that in reality she would have difficulty describing it in words. The palace, of course, as in Disney movies, white pink, puffy clouds around, in short, paradise on earth. And in light from Catherine turned out to be a very weak student, who could hardly reach even to three. You have a memory like a fish, 
three seconds, with irritation, said the teacher, all that I explained in the last lesson, you're out of your head. The guys laughed, and Catherine Nicola in front of his eyes, and by the end of elementary school did not believe that it will turn out of her something good. After ninth grade, she left, although her mother urged her to prolong her childhood and finish 11 years. In the city's only state to and Catherine left, took the documents from the college, although she knew that very upset her mother. Then her mother through her own channels got her a job. Catherine began to babysit other people's children. In this capacity, she was in demand. She did not refuse the most difficult kids, and to the duties of their duties treated faithfully, and took for services inexpensive. She could be hired to escort the child to school and meet him. Catherine was ready to sit with the kids, while the parents were away at the movies or in the theater. But of course, most of all she appreciated the constant work. If she was invited to a boy or a girl, and it was necessary to come in the morning, and leave in the evening. And so day after day, month after month, this is no longer a part-time job, but a salary you can count on something, plan your spending. Therefore, Catherine was very happy when she was invited to a young wealthy family. The child here was only one, a four-year-old boy nanny, pretty and curly as an angel. His mother had been away for a few days for a few hours. Catherine did not know that the woman was then looking at the footage from the video cameras. The girl behaved with the child as usual with children. She read books to Nani, drew with him, went for walks, fed him. The only liberty she allowed herself, if the boy did not finish a banana or peach, she did not throw the rest of the fruit in the trash, but ate it herself. After all, it was a luxury for her. I am satisfied with this nanny, said the woman to her husband, let her work for us at least until her son goes to school. She did not yet know that her husband would decide to have an affair with Catherine. In principle, nothing original to make a mistress out of his servants, old as the world. At first Catherine agreed because she was afraid of losing her job, wanted to please the master, and then became attached to him, and was already agreed to such a double life. She was afraid that sooner or later the landlady would find out, and that she would kick her out. And the husband, of course, will not want to quarrel with his wife, and leave her, Catherine. But everything turned out differently. Catherine got pregnant. Her lover Carlos turned out to be in a sense a decent man, did not offer her to get rid of the child and did not throw her out on the street. He rented an apartment for Catherine and said that if everything turned out this way, he would provide for her. In such a situation women would be divided into two categories. They would be happy to receive such an offer, the others would not have enough. Catherine was not enough, but she pretended to be happy. The contrasts were eating away at her soul. When she checked in at the women's clinic, she said she was single and would raise the child on her own. Then Carlos came and for hours pretended that they had a happy family. He loved Catherine and took care of her. Finally, his wife would call him and ask where he was. Carlos would raise his finger as a sign that Catherine was not to make a sound and lie that he was late at work. His wife would dictate what to buy on the way home. Carlos nodded, and Catherine wanted to shout loudly, so that her wife would hear that she and her husband had just gotten out of bed. And let there would be a tram rampage, with shouting, cursing and divorce because Carlos is in a good place. There, a rich house, friends, lavish parties, a wife and son. Here, mistress, a fresh stream, so to speak, always smiling, satisfied with everything, loves without question. Catherine wondered whether Carlos even sometimes guesses that she lives with her teeth clenched, shows Hollywood smile, tenderness, love and admiration, just so that he realized, she is better than his wife, with her he will be happier. Catherine hoped, when the baby is born, Carlos will be attached to him and draw conclusions. Let him leave his wife half of the fortune and divorce. They and the rest is enough. And to keep the ex-wife from making intrigues, you can move somewhere else, for example, to the sea, which she still has not seen. Finally, Mark was born and Catherine held her breath. But if anything had changed, it was for the worse. The baby cried day and night, Catherine walked exhausted. Now she no longer met Carlos at the set table. Yes and on bed pleasures, frankly, there was no strength or desire. Her friend began to visit her less and less often. No, he faithfully transferred her money for maintenance, was affectionate with her son, but only dropped by just for half an hour, justifying the lack of time. Have you fallen out of love with me? He asked him directly. He was silent for a few seconds and said, you yourself understand everything, kid. He didn't even call her by her name, which was particularly offensive. It felt like a habit. 
a faceless baby, so as not to get confused by his girlfriend's names, and not to offend any by calling her otherwise. Again, if Catherine had a hand on her shoulders, she would not have trudged through life, but stopped and thought, how to be? It was clear that she had to go on alone, and it was necessary to prepare for this path. Maybe she should go to school after all. She could ask her friend for a place to live, ask him to help her with a job, and in return give him freedom and silence. Catherine had to convince Carlos that his wife would not find out anything from her. Instead, the young woman contrived to get pregnant again, decided to take her rival by the number of children. Even her own mother, Aunt Maria, said it was foolish. Nothing scares a man away like small children, she said. You realize that there, in that family, there's a rich kid growing up, as they used to say, a barchin. His father never had any trouble with him. The maid would feed him, change his wet pants and bring him to daddy for a kiss. That's it. What do you have to offer? Exhausted, totally dependent on your Carlos. Only responsibility for you and the kids, hidden reproaches, endless troubles, baby crying. Believe me, he is already tired of you and is looking for an opportunity to be free. So give him that freedom. It's the most desirable thing for him right now. I don't believe you, screamed Catherine and cried angry tears. She was really hysterical. Finally, her mother took pity on her, sat next to her and began to stroke her head. Catherine realized that her mother was right, that Carlos, if he wanted, would have long ago made an offer. It is necessary to pull herself together and think everything through. Going back to her mother's apartment, crying in there all together, it's not an option. Carlos has to help, and if she agrees to disappear from his life, they'll probably do it, maybe even take out a mortgage. Carlos would help with the down payment, would slowly give money, but the hope for a personal life was crumbling. Who needs her with two children? Catherine hoped that she would force herself to act, but she herself ungodly procrastinated, hoping for something, for some kind of avos, that everything will be resolved by some miracle in her favor. And they did. Carlos's wife found out. There were some kind people who saw him going to Catherine's, and although they never appeared on the street together, Carlos, Catherine, and the children, it was not difficult to conclude whose sons they are. Catherine froze, heard in the two the voice of his former mistress. I talked to my husband, said that, and put you on notice that all relations with you, he immediately breaks off. We have a prenup, and he doesn't want to go penniless in that hen house you've set up for him. So you bought his love. Catherine could not stand it. Yes, my dear, the woman's voice so and texts them. He knows that for that way of life, which we with him so much love and appreciate, have to pay. You two would like to grab a piece of the pie, but you jump like a dog around our table and saw that it doesn't work. But attempts to steal someone else's pie don't just go away. They have to be punished. Your punishment will be the following. You simply disappear with your offspring from our lives, and we forget about your existence. An alimony? Catherine shrieked, I can go to court, to prove paternity is now nothing worth. If she wanted to put the former mistress in place, she did not succeed. Do not advise, said that, and Catherine could almost see the woman smiling. You do not want anything to happen to you and your children, right? And it could happen very easily. Some kind of car accident, an accidental hit and run. But, but Catherine is speechless. They're your husband's children. How can you do that? They're his sons, you can't hurt them. They are your sons, the woman said and cut the conversation short. Catherine tried to come to her senses and failed. She was covered with depression. And if before she was babysitting other people's children, now there was no strength to take care of her own. Repression, promised by his wife, began immediately. They had to move out of the rented apartment. Now they were all staying with Aunt Maria. Grandmother fiddled with her grandchildren and Catherine, emaciated, blushing, dressed in a tattered robe, staggered from room to kitchen, smoked one cigarette after another, and said that she was disgusted by everything. And this miserable housing and complete hopelessness ahead, and even her own children she does not want to see. Go for a walk then, finally. Aunt Maria snapped at me. Do you think it's easier for me? I'm sorry, at sixty the strength is not the same. But I have a sense of duty, and I know that the children must be fed. So I'm standing here, boiling their porridge. I can't bear to look at your sad face. Go, let at least a breeze blow on you. Maybe you'll come back in a different mood. Catherine obeyed her advice simply because she wanted to be alone for a while, not to listen to anyone's voices. It is known that there is no greater loneliness than being alone in a crowd. 
There was a park not far from their house. That's where she went. Recently, the park had been renovated. Beautifully tiled alleys, a fountain, planted with toy trees. In the evening, the lanterns burned here under the olden days. Catherine sat down on one of the benches near the fountain, arranged herself so that only the sound of water could reach her. She closed her eyes and put her face to the sun. Maybe that's why she missed the moment he materialized beside her. She felt his gaze first, and then she looked at him herself. Sitting on the bench next to her was the very prince she had been afraid to dream of as a child, because he was too good-looking even for a prince. Tall, he sat, but it still felt that way. Gorgeously built, black tank top revealing swarthy arms, pumped biceps. His hair was black, too, and his eyes were light gray, almost white, with a dark rim. The kind of eyes they say have a lilt to them. The young man looked at her and smiled. The smile was hard, imperious, and at the same time disposing, almost hypnotizing. Catherine did not remember afterward what he had asked her, but it really was like hypnosis. She understood. Whatever he would have offered her, she would have agreed, said, yes. She shook her head, as if trying to shake off an obsession, and heard him ask, Shall we go for a ride? And he nodded at the big shiny car waiting for him in the parking lot near the park. John was having one of those rare days when he was in a good mood. He didn't realize that he wasn't in the mood for a restaurant or even a bar. He walked through the park and ate ice cream from an ice cream cone, just as he had when he was a child. Then he sat down on a bench and happened to see this aunt. Now, in his current position, he could choose almost any girl. And already well understood what attracted his attention. Very young, folded like Barbie dolls, and most importantly, defenseless. He could break any of them but he was especially attracted to those in whom he unmistakably recognized victims. There was nothing about this person that he usually liked. Tiroko was what he called young people, but with blurred figures, unrecognizable faces, and tasteless clothes. However, the girl smelled of something, despair or something, and he caught it unmistakably. Such feelings were akin to enjoying a fine perfume. Shall we go for a ride? He repeated. His lips quivered and formed a sneer. He rose in one supple movement, and the girl rose too, without taking her eyes off him, and followed him to the car. John had come to the city alone, without his usual bodyguards, and therefore the car seemed unusually large and empty. Catherine sat in the back seat and looked in the mirror, and he occasionally took his eyes off the road and smiled at her. She didn't ask anything, and he wasn't going to talk to her. What was there to talk about with such a fool? Soon, however, she would sing, but not as she expected. They were already driving through the woods, on the narrow road to his house, when she suddenly said, I have to get home before dark, I have children. He smiled again. Yes, it was certainly a fairy tale. For some reason she was reminded of beauty and the beast, only she wasn't a beauty herself, but her companion was. His house was like that enchanted castle when the evil fairy had cast a spell on it. Beautiful huge, but so bluey that it made you shiver. The young man himself though he looked like a prince, had eyes like a monster. Come in, he said, and led her toward the house, so that the heels of her shoes clacked on the slabs. He had a beautiful apartment with a balcony overlooking the forest, but most of all John loved the cellar, which stretched under the castle. Here he had a wine cellar and another bedroom, where he went if there was a thunderstorm, since he was afraid of thunderstorms as a child, and his favorite room where he entertained his guests, or rather, his guests. Bring wine and something else, John told one of his assistants, we must feed her first. Catherine couldn't drink at all, but now she was in a strange state. Her nerves were frayed, and yet what surrounded her could be nothing but a dream. She convinced herself of this. What other explanation could she think of for what was going on? John poured her a large glass of wine, and she drank it down like water. And of course, in a few minutes, she was drunk, and everything that happened after that, that huge bed, his hands, his eyes, so close, so close that there was nothing in the world but them. It was all a dream and nothing more. Then she cried. Are you crying already? He asked carelessly. Not realizing that already was the key word in the phrase, for then she was bound to cry. She sniffled even more desperately. Why is it like this? She asked, either to herself or to him or to someone else, to fate or something else. What do you mean like this? He asked. He didn't even throw a blanket over himself. Why is it that I've been the worst since I was a kid, bullied by everyone, and never, never had a chance to change things? 
And now, I know what's going on is a hoax of some kind. I'm either gonna wake up and none of this is happening, or you're just gonna kick me out. And crying, she began to tell him her life. She wasn't ashamed now, and it didn't seem to her that she was acting strangely, opening up to a man who was basically a stranger, with whom she was connected only in bed, and nothing else. That's just the way it is. She talked about how she'd been teased for her beggarly clothes. What else could her mother afford? She was always dropping things, breaking things, getting into trouble. How did the girls like to have a rat like that around, with whom they were beauties and favorites of fate? All these girls had told him about themselves before. They begged him to pity them. They talked about their old parents, about their beloved brothers and sisters, about the fact that life was just beginning for them. They were all happy in that past life and dreamed of returning to it. And this girl was a hundred percent chick, and she was as bored with life as he was. Because everyone was bullying her, and the only person she had any hope of change with preferred her to someone else. And something stirred in his soul for the first time in years. Get out of here, he told her. What? She sobbed again, unable to hear. Get out of here, I said. Get dressed and now they're taking you back to town. You're kicking me out too, she said in a hopeless voice. I'm the unhappiest. You're the luckiest, he smiled his most charming smile. You don't know how lucky you are. Get out of here. He got up and walked out. The hem of his silk robe made his swift movements look like black wings. Ten minutes later, the uncomprehending Catherine was getting into the car. She heard the black-bearded man who was supposed to drive her ask John. Are you letting her go, master? She's memorized this place, hasn't she? She'll never come here again. John leaned against the door and waved to Catherine. Forget it all, understand? It's gonna be bad. She won't listen to you, master, the man said quietly. If she doesn't, she'll regret it, and John left without looking back. Blackbeard drove the car so fast that the scenery outside the window merged. Don't drive, Catherine asked, I'm afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of now, he said in a guttural accent, but no one was kidding. Forget you were here. If you come again, you'll stay here forever. He dropped her off on the outskirts of town and sped off just as quickly, leaving her on the deserted highway wondering how to get home if she had no money in her pocket. Sure enough, home was Armageddon. Frightened Aunt Aria called all the authorities for the fifth time, and the children, left to themselves, began to cry, sensing that something bad had happened. The mother hung around Catherine's neck, squeezed her daughter in her arms, so that she was in pain, kissed her wherever she could. Alive, alive, she repeated. Leave me alone, Mom, Catherine on trembling from fatigue legs went to the bedroom and fell asleep, barely touching his head pillow. It seemed that after this incident, the higher powers had taken Catherine under their protection. Carlos met with her again and secretly handed over a decent amount of money. Invest in a house, he advised, you know, I cannot help you regularly, but maybe I can do something for you and the children from time to time. And if I get married? Catherine asked, squinting, and someone else will raise your boys. God willing, Carlos answered sincerely and corrected himself, God willing, that you meet a good man whom you will love then you and the children will be happy. That moment was enough for Catherine to realize what she had been unable to accept all the previous years. Carlos does not and has never truly loved her or his own sons. He simply had enough sense of duty not to abandon them to their fate. There was no telling how she would have survived this before. And now it didn't hurt her too much, because for the first time in her life, she was truly in love. Yes, with the same mysterious man who was as handsome and enigmatic as the hero of the novel and had condescended to her. She must have touched him in some way, made him like her, or none of this would have happened. The money Carlos gave her went to pay the extra, and very soon Catherine and her children and Aunt Maria moved into a two-room apartment, modest, but quite decent, in a well-to-do neighborhood. Aunt Maria sighed as if she had taken a heavy load off her back. Now let's take a little breather, she said. Aha, Catherine agreed nonchalantly, Mom, I'm pregnant. Aunt Maria sat up like that. But how, she babbled, you have that, completely no mind. You knew that Carlos did not marry you, so did not realize that, and he would place thought. Well, I know what he was thinking. Maybe it's not him, Catherine said with her lips so that her mother didn't hear her. But it's definitely not him. Her mother's brow creased again with a look of anguish. For weeks her fierce arguments with her daughter continued. Aunt Maria insisted that the child must never be left behind. Carlos will not give anything more, and already generous. 
and Cathery, who has no sensible education, no job, no rich relatives, will not pull three children for nothing. Of course, the mother was right, but Catherine stubborn. She wanted to give birth to this child, and would never tell Aunt Maria what she was up to. She dreamt of John. He came to her every night, and in the morning, when she woke up, it was the beginning of a long, burdensome day with his endless responsibilities. Catherine hoped for one thing, that sooner or later John would make himself known, and if he didn't, if it was to be his child, then Catherine would find him. Cheap love novels, which she liked to read, convinced that the man simply cannot resist seeing the hair. The fact that Carlos easily abandoned his sons did not convince Catherine of anything. I will give birth to this baby, Catherine firmly told her mother, and began to look for arguments that would convince the old woman in the justification of such a decision. Three children, this is already a mother of many children. There will be benefits, allowances, and she will go to work. Crying, Aunt Maria arranged for her daughter to work as a social worker, so that she could at least get maternity pay, she said. Ekaterina had never had such a hard time. Her mother always tried to spare her from housework, and now this very work piled on her tenfold. Heavy bags, which had to carry her old people from the stores and account for every penny. Endless queues at polyclinics. Ekaterina stood for coupons for her wards, took for them certificates from utility companies. She also washed windows, cleaned the closets, scrubbed the floors, and spoon-fed the infirm. These odors, she complained to her mother in the evening, I can't take it anymore. All the corners smell of old things. I'm sorting out my clothes and sometimes I'm sick to my stomach. Be patient, Aunt Maria replied nonchalantly, you chose this fate. If you had done the right thing, you would have found a good man and had a family. No, you stole someone else's husband. Here boomerang and flew. Catherine stopped looking for sympathy from her mother. It remained only to look forward to the day when he will go on maternity leave, and at least from hard work will be spared. In the maternity hospital Catherine remembered, and was surprised that this time she came here, by ambulance. On previous occasions, she had been brought here by Carlos. Catherine could not pay for a separate room either. But other than that, everything went great, and she had a baby girl. Give her to me for a minute, or at least show her, still in the delivery room asked Catherine. One look at the baby was enough for her to realize that she was not mistaken. Black hair was unusually thick and long for a newborn and her eyes were exactly like her father's, light gray with a mist, so bright and unusual that it was clear that their color would not change and they would remain that way. Aunt Maria was bitterly convinced that only the hump would be corrected by the grave. Becoming a mother of many children, Catherine did not take up her mind. She could not concentrate on the children and the household. Having done the most necessary things, she was immersed in herself and hovered somewhere in her thoughts. Settle down, Aunt Maria told her, if you hope that I'll give you a shoulder all your life, it's not so. My blood pressure skyrocketing. I need some peace and quiet. Sometimes you want to take a pill and go to sleep and sleep until you sleep, but you don't. If anything happens to your boys, they come running to me. They're used to grandma being there for them. And when the baby cries at night, a mother has to sleep half-eyed. I used to wake up when you, little one, just move in your crib and you'd be asleep. How many times I got up at night to comfort your daughter? I was your only one, and I have a lot of children, snapped at Catherine. And who is to blame for this? Sarcastically asked Aunt Maria, remember, drive me into the coffin, you will be even harder. But Catherine did not believe in such a prospect. Her mother was always, and all her life remained too living, pulled any load. And now, of course, she is just boasting. All her free time Catherine spent to find out anything about John, to find a place where he lives. At one time, she couldn't even figure out where he had brought her. She could only orient herself by the time she'd spent on the road and the fact that it was a forested area. Now she was looking at images on the internet, satellite images and finally figured out this huge house, located in the deepest part of the forest. She decided to go there with her daughter, let her have a girl, not a boy, but the appearance of little Ada is such that it is impossible to doubt the paternity. But then there was an event, not that upset her plans, but made her postpone them for a while. Aunt Maria had a hypertensive crisis, yes, so much so that had to call an ambulance. A guy arrived, very inexperienced, all the time calling someone on the phone, advising what and how to do. He measured her blood pressure, put a couple of pills under her tongue, gave her an injection and said goodbye. And two hours later, 
Aunt Maria was no longer able to comprehend anything. She had lost her speech, and the right half of her body was desensitized. This time an experienced team arrived, and the paramedic immediately sent Catherine to find helpers for transportation. Your mother has a stroke, we take her to the hospital. But even here, Catherine had not yet realized how serious it was. She had no doubt that her mother would pull through. She was only worried about one thing, how many days she will spend in the hospital, and whether she, Catherine, at this time with the household. Therefore, when she received the call that Aunt Maria had died, the news stunned her completely. For a while she sat there and just came to herself. Of course, then began the whole cycle of organizing funerals and memorial services. And if there is no one to take on these worries, then the relatives have no time to plunge headlong into grief. Fortunately, the women around whom Aunt Maria had worked all her life raised money and organized the funeral. But when the funeral and all the ceremonies were left behind, Catherine felt that the world collapsed. All the troubles, which had previously taken on her mother, now lay on her, the money left. Cotton Apalico, teachers in the kindergarten complained that her boys are fighting off hands and also had to look for a new job more money because otherwise their small family will have to live on hunger. Catherine tried to get in touch with Carlos and poke at least some money, but it turned out that the former friend changed the number. Called the home number, the wife came to the phone and recognized Catherine by the silence. She was breathless enough to answer the phone. I'll call the police, Carlos' wife promised. I'll tell them you're blackmailing us, and make sure they believe me. There was no one else to turn to, so Catherine decided to carry out her long-standing plan. First, she went to the local psychic and took her all the cash she had left. So what do you need? Asked the Vidunia, Dodorat, or Spell. Catherine thought for a moment. If it was about Carlos, everything would be clear. Turn away from his wife, a spell to bird, to Catherine. A complex service. But nothing about John was clear. About one man I want to know, said Catherine honestly, how he treats me and whether we will ever be together. The fortune teller did not behave in an original way. She asked for a picture of John and something that belonged to him. Catherine had both. She found the photo by accident on some website, and the one time she'd been to the castle, she brought a handkerchief. That little piece of silk was the only proof that she hadn't dreamed the whole story. And Ada's daughter, of course another proof. The fortune teller first held her hand over the handkerchief, and Catherine noticed how her fingers trembled. Then the woman looked into the picture and recoiled. She tried to restrain herself, but still Catherine noticed the movement. Don't go near him, the fortune teller said. Catherine wrinkled her nose unhappily. What nonsense? Why? He is not even seemingly married. And close do not come close, the fortune teller quickly pushed away from herself a handkerchief and a photo and then leaned over to Catherine and said, looking her straight in the eyes, This man is evil. He has nothing but evil in his soul. If you come near him, there will be great misfortune. But I have his daughter. Catherine couldn't stand it, she shrieked. Does he know about it? No, she confessed. And don't tell him, said the fortune teller. Never tell him. Does the girl look like him? Very much. Then get out of here, so we can't even see her by chance in the street. But what kind of trouble are you talking about? Interrogated Catherine. The fortune teller laid out the cards on the table, and each next card she laid out, met with a stiff nod, accurately saying, I expected so. The cards were all black, spades and some crosses. Better you don't know. The fortune teller grinned stiffly and mixed the cards. Catherine lost sleep. And if before she was ready to believe the otherworldly forces, now more and more the desire was breaking through in her, to do exactly as she wanted, not to listen to anyone, and be as it will be. The day came when, having sent the boys to kindergarten in the morning, she called a cab and named the village where the road to the castle, lost in the woods, began. Catherine tried to dress her daughter as best as possible. The girl was naturally pretty and now she looked like a doll. On the road Ada, John couldn't remember if there had ever been a time when he'd been loved in his own family. Maybe when his mother hadn't divorced his father yet. But when he turned three, his father had already left for the ends of the earth with his new love, and his mother had a new husband. Humiliated by her husband's infidelity, she hurried to prove to herself and to the whole world, it is worth it to dissolve the marriage, as she will not be alone for a single day. The mother was not a very good-looking woman, but they say of such women, she has something in her. Tall, thin like a model, very beautiful haircut, 
She always got her hair cut by the best hairdresser in town. Big dark eyes. A little bit of her mother reminded him of a young Jacqueline Kennedy. John thought about it when he became an adult and accidentally saw a photo of the widow of the American president. Photos of his father at home did not remain, exactly mother wanted to break with the past absolutely all ties. And the stepfather was a man completely invisible, as my grandmother would say, Soapy. When he married my mother, he was about 50 years old and had no children of his own. It would seem, be happy that you got a son. It remains to be seen whether a common child will be born. But stepfather John immediately hated. At the same time, he was smart enough not to tell his mother about it. If the stepfather openly stated his feelings and demanded that the child anywhere to give grandparents or in a boarding school, the mother would have nothing left but to part with him. But the stepfather said that the stepson has a difficult character. This is a three-year-old, and if he is not put on the right path, the family will be bad. After a few months, John feared his stepfather like fire. They had a dog, an old mutt who liked to sleep in the closet. She would sneak in there, snuggle up in the dark, and fall asleep in a pile of stuff. John began to follow suit. His stepfather came home from work before his mother. He wouldn't let her steps and go to kindergarten. The boy would be totally spoiled there. So John hung around the empty house all day. He didn't know how to tell time yet, but he knew that when both hands of the clock slid down, it was time to hurry to his hiding place. He would lurk there, having learned to bolt the closet from the inside and wait until his mother returned from work. His stepfather, on the other hand, never looked for him. When he arrived, he threw off his heavy shoes with pleasure. He stomped into the kitchen, pulling out what his mother had prepared that morning. John knew the food was primarily for him, but he tried to take as little as possible. The most important thing for him was to keep his stepfather fed and satisfied. The man always brought a drink from work. Not vodka, not my god. My stepfather insistently emphasized that strong alcohol he does not take in his mouth never goes down to white, but beer was his specialty. And by the time his mother came back, he had time to get pretty drunk. Can's stepfather threw in the garbage chute, and the mother had to believe that no one drank here, and the man is sober as a glass. It was the kind of game John realized that they played every night. At first, when the boy was still in hiding, he would witness these drinking parties, and his stepfather would beat him, not sparingly, not in proportion to his strength beat him to keep him quiet and not to talk. It could well have been a disaster, once the stepfather threw the kid so that he hit his temple on the corner of the nightstand. But John was lucky. He was never seriously injured, and the stepfather threatened. If the boy tells about the beatings of his mother, the next day you will kill him. And John kept quiet. He even persuaded his mother to let him bathe by himself, so she wouldn't accidentally see his bruises and bruises on his body. He realized now that this was just another dirty, behaved very quietly, and Catherine thanked God for that. She was terribly agitated, and she did not want to deal with the whims of the little girl. Which house should I take you to? The cab driver asked when they entered the village. Catherine hastily pulled out of her purse money. Here, but if you can, we'll go further, it won't take long, I'll show you on the map on my phone, and I'll pay the extra amount of course. The cab driver didn't mind. He'd been trying to get Catherine to talk to him all the way there, and he hadn't given up trying to talk to her now. I've never driven here, he said, obediently sending the car forward. What a beautiful forest, in the fall there are probably a lot of mushrooms, we should get together sometime for a silent hunt. And Catherine sat there, tense as a string. At any minute one of those black-bearded scary men could come out on the road and stop the car. Oh, the clairvoyant was probably right, she should have listened to her. But they made it all the way to the castle without a hitch. And the cab driver whistled. I didn't know that we have such beauty here. I was in Tagliati, there is such a Garibaldi castle. But there the place is crowded, it's easy to get there, but here, how much effort has been invested, and people have built in the middle of nowhere. They'll lose income. And for the hotel is inconvenient, too far from the city, and on holidays for the same reason will not be filmed. And I'm not talking about photo shoots. Catherine slipped him a few more banknotes. Wait for you? Asked the cab driver. Hey, what did you say? No, perhaps not. Catherine took the girl in her arms and went to the gate. It's all the same now, dead or gone. She heard the car start behind her, the cab driver drove away, and Catherine was already walking down the driveway, wondering if anyone would open the door for her. A tall, dark-haired man in a black shirt appeared in front of her, as if from under the ground. 
There was a question in his gaze, but there was something else that made Catherine shudder. A cold, ruthless determination to do anything. I? Me? She babbled. Here's a girl. I've been here before. And now? This is your master's daughter. The man glanced at the child, then made a sign to Catherine to stay put and disappeared into the house. She waited a long time, about a quarter of an hour. Ada grew weary and began to whimper softly. Finally the door opened, and the man gestured again for her to come in, then led her down the long, bluely corridors. Finally, he nodded, this way. The room she entered was a library, bookshelves from floor to ceiling. A desk, probably insanely expensive, probably stolen from a museum somewhere. Anyway, it looked like a guest from the 19th century. She didn't notice John right away, he was standing in the darkest corner. You woke me up, he said. Catherine was expecting a lot of things, but not that phrase. It was not how she wanted to start the conversation. That's why she was confused and asked. It's the middle of the day, have you slept yet? It doesn't matter to me what time of day it is outside. I often confuse day with night. John sat down in the armchair and looked at Catherine with the baby in her arms. To her he did not offer her a seat. Catherine stepped forward. Here, I wanted to show you. This is yours, ours. I've already been told, John didn't even look at the baby. And what do you want? I, I wanted you two to meet. Catherine felt like a complete fool. I warned you not to come here, John said almost gently. Why did you disobey? But our daughter, he said, as if speaking to himself, this is not a good time for me, and my best friend is silence. I don't need any unnecessary rumors, gossip, searches, at least not yet. So I'm gonna give you one more chance, but I need to get it into your stupid head that there won't be a third. So you're going to leave now, but alone. The baby stays here. How? Catherine's mouth dropped open. And you'll know now John was mouthing the words that if you ever try to come here again or investigate my house, your offspring will have his neck snapped immediately. As long as you're quiet, the girl will live here quietly. She'll be looked after. What are you so nervous about? It's not that bad for you. You're not a very good mother. I was curious, and I know you came to me that time, forgetting about home and kids. Forget about that little brat, too. And now, get out. Back home. Catherine began to go crazy. Now it noticed already in neighbors. She could go to the stairwell in a nightgown, untidy, and stand like that for hours until someone took her back to the apartment. What are you doing here? A neighbor pounced on her. Waiting, answered Catherine lifelessly. Who are you waiting for? Where's your daughter? She, Catherine thought for a moment. She's with relatives. She's fine. Good. Then you go home and lie down. Let's call a doctor for you. But Catherine, not listening, like a somnambulist wandered into the depths of her apartment and the door closed behind her. But when her son started knocking on the same neighbor's door and crying, asking for something to eat, the woman could not stand it and called first the social services, and those already, a psychiatric team. The boys were sent to a rehabilitation center, and Ekaterina was put on injections. She was not found to have any severe incurable mental illness, but she was clearly still inadequate. In the first, most acute time she was lying alone, she was given sleeping pills and other medications. Then she was moved to a triple room. Neighbors Natalie and Katie. Compared to Catherine, they seemed quite healthy. They went to eat in the hospital canteen and whispered long after the lights were turned off in the evenings. Natalie was just overstressed, too much on her shoulders. And the moment her life took a turn for the better, she began to hallucinate. There was a time when she loved this town, as a child. Childhood dresses everything in magical colors. It finds its poetry in the courtyards where boiler rooms and mechanic shops operate. Every sprawling butch could be a castle for a doll. Every high-rise building shining in the evenings with its lights on, a huge ship sailing far away on a dark ocean. And then comes youth, which lifts the soul on tiptoe, and one sees with eyes that one will never be allowed to see again, the summer of her 17th birthday. Graduation exams, rainy, warm and windy days, green waterfalls of poplar trees, huge bouquets of peonies, pale pink and white, just opened, smelling dizzy, wet with rain, a light silk dress, white, in the same pink colors, and a wind that seemed to carry her through the world, through life as its ruler. She longed fiercely for the institute. 
The dirt and bustle of the dormitory was nothing. It's always being in the open that's unbearable. Five people in a room. Five girls without any imagination, dreaming of staying forever in this regional center. Why? To avoid being assigned to the village. Which way? By marriage, it almost doesn't matter with whom. As long as I have a local registration in my passport. Dormitory, university, streets, people everywhere. Not for a minute to be alone with herself. Not to forget what is dear to her. At night, she dreamed of the silence of her room. And only a few times, no more often than birthdays and New Year's nights, the one who was not there in life came in her dreams and took her hand in his, and everything came true. Her childhood happiness came back to her and flight and the unspoken things that melted and slipped away as soon as she opened her eyes. She thought that she would return home and the Institute would remain in her memory as a terrible dream. But that day came, and it became clear at once that one does not enter the same river twice. It's not the same anymore. She's an adult, and she's on her own at work, and no one is responsible for her life but herself. And in the evenings there is no strength for anything but the realization of the passing of time and the emptiness, the fruitlessness of this flow. And that's no way to think. What was there to live for? She believed that she might never marry, because with rare constancy no one liked her. Though she was attractive in appearance, even unusually attractive, but always she was carried in these cloudy spheres and others perceived it as excessive seriousness, looking down on everything, and she did not even try to court. But still she married. This man was simple enough not to notice anything strange in her, and she was already tormented by the loneliness she had longed for before. Spouses are two oxen drawn to the same plow. It was partly true. Now there is no fear of delayed wages or buying potatoes for the fall. There are other shoulders strong enough to carry sacks, and no matter how trivial, the warmth of another man's body nearby, and the dreams were less and less frequent, or rather, almost no dreams at all. I wish I could get to bed, and as in a black pit, from which in the morning you hardly come out. And when the children went, she knew that both close and unfamiliar people condemned her for such luxury. A child like a car requires a certain amount of cash. No money, don't have one. White socks, lacy blankets, sparkling bottles, and herself with a nice stroller. She had her last child during the default, on that very August day, when cash melted like smoke and stores hastily closed to rewrite prices. Somebody got even richer, built themselves another villa in the Canaries, and her newborn was deprived of the most modest dowry, and her warm winter coat was taken away from her. Running in the cold almost in a raincoat neighbors aghast, and said the traditional words about the proliferating poverty. And then, shoes with bows pre-fashionable from a box in the attic pulled out of the attic, empty soup for lunch, and the same squirrel carousel month after month. I had to get a job, but where could I find one? Young people have grown up, they understand computers and are looking for the most fashionable positions. Managers, supervisors, merchandisers, or something in the same vein, you can't pronounce it, and simply no children, no whips, always ready, ready for anything. The unemployment office is shrugging their shoulders. They have two vacant positions, a cleaner and a checkroom attendant. Tears at night instead of dreams. What does the day ahead hold in store for us? And there's no hope in sight. Then suddenly she was offered a job. Later she'll say, it's an idiot's dream come true. And not just any job for the envy of others. The quiet and spaciousness of a private office. This very office equipment, previously only seen on television. Co-workers are polite, and the salary can plug all the holes. Dress up, raise children, teach, treat. There's enough for everything. Except for the boss. All roads lead to Rome. All ends end up in her. Her angry, threatening, I'll fire you. She's young, but the boss has to justify her existence. And she's got it all wrong. Do it wrong ten times. Get out of your skin. It won't be the same. She come home at midnight. Didn't see the kids. Computer lines merging in her eyes. Panic in her heart that she's gonna get fired. And what? It's the end of the world. You can't keep teetering on the edge for too long. You can't go this way or that way, but you can't always be on the edge. No one believes she applied for the job herself. How could they? For a job like that, other people would take it with their hands and feet and teeth. In this day and age, in your position, no one realized that there's no more strength to be afraid, and there's no place in the soul where they wouldn't wipe their feet on you. 
It was like she woke up one August day. She went out on the porch into the garden. It was a quiet morning. Warm. Smells like apples. There's a carpet of them on the grass. We should pick them, make jam, foam for the children. For the second time this summer roses are blooming lushly. I can pick a bouquet in the morning dew and take it home to the table. Soft pink, dark red, lemon yellow roses. Dainty as you don't see in every painting. She cuts the roses in quietly before anyone gets up, recites a prayer. And it's not scary and calm. She recites ancient words, grown, and how smart they'd gotten. There was no time to notice life. And now it is as if she stopped, amazed eyes to discover. Yes, how could the morning, the same freshness that was in her seventeen, and the children who wait for all her tales, and the books she remembered as friends, and the whole world, which is not close to her at all, rejoice in it. And that night, before she could put her head on her pillow, came the one she thought would never come again and he gave her his hand. Katie's situation was different. She thought she was desperately unlucky. For the first time in her life, she wanted to kill a man. If it was a villain, that would be fine, but no. To understand the extent of her desperate bloodlust, please know that it was a quiet, good-natured man. The man with the camera. Everyone recognized that he had talent. His exhibitions gathered the inhabitants of a small town and worked for sale, sold out instantly. These were not Sulla's paintings from a store. His works breathed. Everything in front of you was alive, awakening, rising from behind the Volga sun or asleep in a stack of boys. And behind the awe with which the author caught such moments, you could feel the kindness and sensitivity of his soul. But when this recognized genius decided to make their department happy and by Valentine's Day to make each a portrait. No, at first she was as excited as everyone else. She was rarely photographed. In the last five years when she changed her passport from the old to the new, there's got to be something left over from every period in her life, right? Besides, even was so conscientious. Standing up, sitting down, lying down, taking pictures of you from all angles, turning you this way and that. Surely, it will be something to hang on the wall and even secretly admire herself. Yes, it's me. She deliberately let her hair loose and hid her chin in the luxury of her black and white sparkling black moor collar. She kept her eyes closed for a moment, then opened them to give her eyes a look of mystery. While leafing through a thick glossy magazine at the hairdressers, she'd accidentally read that this was how models did it. It was supposed to look like this. Accent on the face, the rest in a haze. Dark eyes, a scattering of curly hair. She was at the age when the face becomes defined. The experience is reflected on it, but not yet aged. Youthful self-confidence was being replaced by a realization of her actual strength, and that meant a lot, too. When Evan, with his usual quiet smile, put the pictures on her desk, she realized she was capable of murder. No, what kind of camera does he have that only takes pictures of cockroaches, so that every hair on their legs could be distinguished? But who would do that to a woman? There she is, please awkwardly propping up a wall that's just been decorated in Euro style. Where to begin to put a fat cross on herself? The top. Her hair isn't curly at all, but hangs down in shreds as if chemically burned. Every day of her 32 years is stamped on her face, at least the darkest of those days. It's not the look of an arrogant movie diva, but of a dog looking for a master. Oh, there's a comparison. The paws hang down like spaniel ears, and the eyes like the same dog left on the street and every wrinkle is drawn with mascara, and eyes that are red from the computer. I, I, and Evan's the one who got screwed after that, definitely. I wonder if that's how he shoots his Varvara, who never leaves his lips. Varvara wanted new shoes, Varvara read a book, Varvara says this and that, and thinks otherwise. Everyone already knows everything about Varvara, and her popularity pisses off the Fino co-workers. But if Evan filmed his capricious wife in this way, their work team would be orphaned. She sat there swallowing tears. A photo of my ass? An artist they called him. Von Suyunin is a different matter. She has not been photographed by him, only heard that he first of all drags each of his models to the wash basin. He washes off everything he can. Then he puts her makeup on, does her hair, wraps her in all sorts of things, drapes her, showing off what's beautiful about the model. Maybe it'll just be the hand, the long thin fingers, the ring, and everything else in the semi-darkness. 
a girl I know, Maddie, almost got married that way. All the Western suitors went crazy over her portraits. She picked out the most worthy one, went to Washington to meet him, and on the platform immediately recognized him. He was in the same jeans and t-shirt as in his photo. But he passed by, and even after a call to recognize her did not want to recognize his dream in her. But so that so immediately faced the table. At home mom saw that her daughter has tears in her eyes and began to timidly comfort. Maybe it's the bangs. Take it away and... It's not about the bangs, she answered gloomily, it's about the face that looks out from under it. You can't take it off. If everything in life was like in the novels, there would be a gift of fate in the person of a cool macho. And he would comfort her and tell her that she's really beautiful, and she would turn from his words before her eyes, at least into Julia Roberts. In life, unfortunately, macho men don't just fall out of the sky. And yet something in her was so deeply affected that she decided to take a very unusual step. She went to Anna. Anna was the best hairdresser in town. In fact, still a girl, herself wearing the simple ponytail, with clients work wonders. Anna immediately realized that with a gluey client is better not to chirp, and really transform her, as far as possible. Anna in this case performed the role of macho. For three hours at least she transformed her into a woman with a capital letter. She cut her hair, curled it, styled it, I breathed on her face, and sometimes I didn't even breathe while applying makeup. When she opened her eyes, she really looked like a queen. Waves of vibrant brown hair flowed along her face, blooming with the most delicate colors. That lilac translucency of the eyelids, the well-defined lips, the youthful blush. From the hairdresser's store, she went to the store and paid for the dress she had not dared to buy for months, and no one else had dared, because of the price. The women at work were numb to say the least. Crowd came to her office to greedy female eyes to embrace her new look and find in it at least something not that to calm the soul. They felt her dress, they could have groped her face to wipe off the blush. But those women are nothing. Even would come in and give her his professional male gaze, he's gonna grab his machine. He came. He walked briskly past her desk, but stopped and looked at her face. Why are you so red? He asked anxiously, do you have a fever? That same day, Ola began to feel as if her heart was stopping. Just like that, stop beating, that's all. Ah, she clutched her chest, it stopped. No pulse. Call an ambulance. After a month, during which such attacks were repeated regularly, and she was put under treatment in the psychoneurological department. When the pills began to work on Catherine, she paid attention to the doctor who treated her and new friends on the ward. To each he treated in the utmost attention, tried to help, but a bitter crease forever lay between his eyebrows. He's a widower, Natalie whispered English, but he used to live in Mexico. So what? Catherine raised her eyebrows. His wife died there, an accidental victim, and his daughter was left an invalid. He sick himself. When he got a job here, they found out that he had cancer. They said, how are you gonna work? It's a lot of work, and he said he could handle it. He said he had to survive and get back on his feet. Otherwise, who will take care of the girl? She's just a little girl, and you know he did it. The disease began to recede. Catherine began to greet Anthony with a special smile. He treated her successfully, and she felt better. She knew that now she would do her best to make the doctor pay attention to her, succumb to her charms. There's a woman who's a mother, and then there's a woman of easy virtue. Well, that's the B that Catherine's mother used to say. The key word here is woman, Catherine replied with a smile. Thoughts of the baby retreated, disturbing her less and less. Potty will not hurt the girl, she thought, remembering John, he is her father. How can he hurt his daughter? No, still Catherine was incorrigible. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.